Hi, I'm David Coulthard, and joining me this week on Heineken's Non-Race Sundays is the team principal of Ferrari, Mattia Bonotto. Mattia, how are you? Yeah, great, thanks. Uh, certainly not the easiest period of my professional life, but I think that uh, here in Ferrari we are still all committed, united, and I think that's uh, at least good to see a team uh, working so united in such a difficulty. Yeah, well, I think that uh, you don't need me to tell you that you are at the head of the most famous team in Formula One, part of this championship since its inception in 1950. Before we talk a little bit about Ferrari, I know you've been part of the journey personally for about 25 years, maybe if my research is correct, about 23 on the, on the actual racing operation. But a lot of people maybe don't know much about you, the man. Now, <laughs> stop me if this is because you are very, very private about your, your personal life. But I, I would love to share with our audience, our Formula One fans, a little bit about your journey. Now, I know you studied engineering in, in Switzerland, but from that point to joining Ferrari, can you fill in a little bit the blanks? Because clearly something has ignited your passion for motor racing and something that has taken you to the head of this great team. Um, honestly, from being graduate at the university and starting in Ferrari, it has been only one day. Uh, so the blank, <laughs> the blank, <laughs> the blank is very little. <laughs> but um, no, I'm born in Switzerland, that's why I studied there. Um, I'm now 50 years old, almost 51. Uh, I have always been passionate of motorsport. I have always been passionate of F1. I am a tifosi of Ferrari since I was very young. I was watching the races on TV with my grandfather. Uh, so I really passionate. I remember certainly and the love the time of Gilles Villeneuve, for example. That was certainly a myth for me. Uh, and then I had the chance, really, and the opportunity to, to join Ferrari as graduates. So I started my career in Ferrari, my very first job here in Ferrari, Scuderia, as a graduate, uh, working as engine, young engine engineer. Um, and then uh, moving on the race team in 1997, I had the, the privilege, I have to say, in the following years as well, to, to be and to engineer Michael Schumacher as engine engineer. Uh, and I think that my experience is really as engine as first, race track as second, um, obviously growing up in terms of responsibilities, uh, becoming at one stage technical director of the power unit, then finally technical director of Scuderia Ferrari, and since now slightly more than any other the team principal. But, but if anything, it has never been my, my ambition. I think it was my dream to work in Scuderia Ferrari, but I had no ambition on whatever was the role. So I think really I, I moved up in all, all the stairs and on the, all the steps and uh, 25 years from graduate to, to team principal. And I think that, that's great. I think it's not great for me. I think it's a great example for all the people working in Ferrari. Because it's somehow showing that uh, there are great opportunities in, within that, that team and that company. When you mention about your early days in the engine department of Ferrari, I've always felt as a driver that the engine is, is kind of overlooked when it, when it comes to the credit and the performance of, of uh, a Grand Prix victory. Everyone talks about the driver on the podium spraying the champagne. They talk about tire strategy. They talk about, you know, aero is king. But there's so many moving parts in an engine where do you start when, you, when you're designing and working with your, your team? Do you start with the, 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 the crankcase? Do you start with the piston? How many parts is it in an engine? Certainly more than in a, in a car. Yeah, that's, I see. the engine or the power units today are certainly very complex. Uh, I, I had myself the, the luxury. I started when it was still the V12. Uh, so standard aspirated engines, V12. I've seen the V12, I've seen the V10, the V8, finally the V6, hybrid era. Uh, the engine and the power unit are certainly very complex, but the hurt of the engine is always the combustion. Yeah? So if, if any, if you need to start from, you will start by studying the combustion itself and then designing the engine around it, somehow making that combustion becoming tru truth. Huh? And, uh, and that, that's, that's the way. Uh, it's an incredible, incredible thing. And I, I, like you, have had the experience in my journey to drive, first of all, a V12, 
in, as a test driver and then through the V10s and V8s and of course with the high revving engines. If I recall during that normally aspirated time, we were well over 20,000 RPM. Yeah. Can, can you even explain to the public what that must be like for the pistons going yeah, up and down? It's, uh, if you consider it's really, so few manufacturers achieve, as you said, the 20,000. That means more than 300 times up and down in a second. Yeah? And that's a mechanical part. So in a mechanical part, moving up and down 300 times in a second, I think that, that's sufficient to explain. It's an incredible thing. So it, your background there in, in engines, but uh, you've obviously risen to the very top of this in, uh, iconic team. I feel that in interviewing you for this Heineken non-race Sunday, I, I, I feel guilty. I feel I should apologize because in amongst the 240 victories that for, uh, Ferrari have had in Formula One, and during that iconic period with yourself and Jean Todd and, and Ross Braun and the likes, I got in the way a couple of times. You know, Spa in 98 <laughs> sticks in mind. It was an accident. I'm sorry that, that that victory isn't on your CV, but this is motorsport, isn't it, sometimes? Yeah, I think we remember it very well. Uh, <laughs> I think that and I think whenever we need to show some images of the past and the history of Ferrari, this image is, is always coming back. But I think, you know, Dave, it was great to have you as a competitor, not a driver, but certainly to, to having you as a driver sitting in other cars. I think it was great time, the, uh, great times, really. I, this is myself, I enjoy them a lot, um, maybe because I was younger, uh, but, uh, but certainly it was great. Yeah, well, Michael and I were able to joke about that many, many uh, years afterwards over a over his uh, favorite drink, but uh, yeah, it was a little bit uncomfortable at the time. Tell me the truth, by the way. You break yeah. <laughs> on purpose. <laughs> Actually, the truth is that's as fast as I could go. It was so wet, I couldn't see, and, and Michael was the master in those wet conditions, but no, no, I never break. But I remember Jean Todd thought, uh, he went to Ron Dennis, and he thought it was a conspiracy. But I'm a sportsman, I would never do that. <laughs> So, right, 1,000 races of Ferrari coming up. Now, putting to yeah. one side the challenges of a normal championship, you've been part of this, this journey for 20-odd years. Ferrari is more than just a race team. You know this. You hear it all the time when you're interviewed. But can you, to, to a, a Ferrari fan sitting in South America or in North America or in Australia, can you really explain what this means to a nation like Italy and to Fiorano, where the, the team is based? Yeah, so as first, 1,000 Grand Prix, I think we should, that's a big number. Huh? 1,000 is always a big number. It took 70 years for Ferrari to achieve it, uh, because Ferrari has been then, as you said, since the very start in 1950. Um, I think myself, if it took 70 years, I will not be there for the 2,000 Grand Prix. Uh, so at the end, it's, it's such a big number, and I think what we are celebrating here in Mugello is, is really a, a fantastic milestone, is, is celebrating the myth of the Cavallino, is, is celebrating the entire history. I don't think it's only celebrating what has been the past, but it's looking forward to the next 70 years or the next 1000 Grand Prix, because Ferrari has always been part of the motorsport of F1 and will continue to be part of the motorsport and the F1 in the future as well. So, so I think it's really celebrating one myth, which is the Cavallino Rampante, uh, which is well known wherever you go. And I got many fans uh, wherever we are racing. We've got our fans there supporting us. Uh, it's really a family. It's not only the racing team, the family, but the entire, let me say, community around ourselves. Yeah, I think it must be, it must be an incredible, incredibly proud moment to put on the, the, the Ferrari shirt and to represent this brand with such a great history. Um, you've had some very loyal partners over the years. Uh, maybe you didn't have to be so involved with them uh, when you were more on the technical side, but now as team principal, you, you, your role is overreaching between drivers, between the partners that support the team. How, how, do you, how do you deal with this? How do you recognize the, the partners that support Ferrari? Uh, obviously, 
even as technicians, you've got technical partners, uh, important technical partners uh, for Scuderia Ferrari. So if you look at our partners, I think it's really uh, long-standing. Huh? Uh, so partners we had, which have been for Ferrari even for more than 25 years. Uh, Shell was there at, uh, at the start in 1950. Uh, so it's a matter of trust. I think it's even more, it's a matter of sharing our vision, our values, collaborate as much as we can because we need to build and to build the future. And uh, building the future means that you cannot do it by yourself. You need, you need help and support. And the partners are key elements in that. I think that, that that's uh, something that I absolutely recognize as well, having good partners on board. One thing that I'm curious to know, in terms of the challenge of modern Formula One, obviously this year is a very unusual year for everybody. But I think Formula One has led the way the, the constructor teams, the governing body, the uh, commercial rights holder have shown that if you work together, you can put a world championship on track. In terms of how the sport has evolved in, in your more than 20 years, would you say it's, it's more difficult today to, to find advantage or, or technic you know, technical uh, improvements than it was? Or is it just the same, but maybe there's more spotlight on performance than there was in the beginning? Um, I think maybe that's my judgment, but I believe that today the competition is very, very high. So we've got very strong and really very strong competitors. Uh, so it means that the level of uh, organizations, the level of technical development, the level of commitment resources is very high. And I think that in that respect, the exercise is even much more challenging compared eventually to the past. If we look at the Ferrari winning cycle, you mentioned before, uh, Jean Todd, etc. it took six to seven years really uh, to start winning has been uh, the same for, uh, for Red Bull and Mercedes on the following year. So, but that's down really to time, building organization, uh, creating uh, the foundations. Uh, so I don't think that today the technical is eventually more difficult because you've got always a challenge and whatever it is. Uh, yeah. Simply or not, it's still a challenge. I think what we've got today is a more uh, high and demanding competition. Yeah. yeah. One thing while you're talking there that comes to my mind is I've always found uh, it fascinating, the mis misnomer, which is teammates. You know, I have good friendships with my ex-teammates today, but when we were racing together, we were not friends. You know, Mika and I were always, you know, at each other's uh, heads trying to find an advantage. How is it actually between the team principles? And I wouldn't put you on the spot to say which one you prefer, but actually, is it the same as being a teammate? You, 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 admire, you have respect, but actually there's no friendship until the competition stops. Yeah, I, I think it's a good comparison. Uh, so when we are finding ourselves for a beer, we may be friends. But when, when we are discussing regulations, we are certainly not friends and we are competitors. And I think it's, uh, we, all really, we are all focused on our own organization, uh, our own team. Uh, and I think there is only one objective for all of us. And I think whatever you can do to achieve it, you will do it. Yeah. If, if I can just step back a little bit, you, you mentioned earlier about your early journey watching Formula One with your grandfather. And I'm sure he'd be extremely proud to see what you've achieved within the sport. Uh, you, you say you're part of the Tifosi. You know, I always feel I'm a racing fan who was lucky enough to drive the cars. A little bit of fantasy right now for, for the fans of, of Formula One. Putting your current drivers to one place, if you were picking to be the team principal of two of the great Ferrari drivers in the past, you mentioned Gilles Villeneuve, so I assume maybe you would want him in your team. Who, who, who else would you have there? I mentioned Michael as well. Uh, I think yeah. that I doubt. So uh, because I, I, I had the privilege to, to be part of the team at the time. I grow with him. Uh, I, I learn my, somehow my job uh, together with him. So, so I think he was in his attitude uh, as a leader, so demanding that he had. Because at the end, it's not only a matter of talent. It's not only a matter of being great as a technician, as a driver. As a manager, it's really a matter of mental, mental, let me say, mental approach to, to, to the exercise and uh, the winning mentality. Uh, it's not something that, it's something that you may learn, huh? but it's important <coughs> to know. 
So again, I, I appreciate your time and I appreciate your mind is very much in this Formula One season. But I'm just for my own personal uh, enlightenment. If you were to pick your, your, the victory that stands out from maybe that Michael period, or it could be another race, that there was adversity, technical problems that we didn't know about, but somehow you managed uh, the team to, to, to get a victory. Is, is there one special race win that you remember? Was it the first victory that you were involved as a young engineer? Or is it the last win? You know, how, how do you look at this? I think that all wins are, are important and there are a few that may be even greater. I, I remember certainly the last last year in Monza was a fantastic victory with Charles, yeah. the first one as well, uh, was there with Charles on, in Monza itself. So, but but I got memories of the time of Michael. My, as you said, my very first victory was on track. Being there at the racetrack was in 96 in Belgium. I can certainly remember it. Uh, so, but there are many. I remember once in Manicur, I can't remember the year, we got a failed exhaust. We managed the entire race or whatever was left on the race distance to complete the race, finishing first. Uh, as engine engineer, it was tough, but still uh, an enjoy enjoyment at the end. Yeah, uh, I love those uh, victories that come when uh, the team comes together and, and finds solutions during the Grand Prix. Mm. Uh, conscious of time, so just bringing it forward to uh, when by the time this uh, will air, we'll have been in Mugello, uh, one of the truly challenging racetracks. I believe it's owned by Ferrari, um, or certainly it was. Uh, I think the drivers who have not been there before, mm -hmm. their eyes will be out on stocks, like going to Monaco for the first time or going to Suzuka. Um, you, you've got any, any insight to the challenge of a great circuit like Mugello? Yeah, so, so yes, uh, Mugello is still, still owned by Ferrari, so it's our own circuit. I think that's first, it's very great to celebrate our 1000 Grand Prix in there. So I have to say thanks as well to F1 organization, to Chase Carey, to let us have the opportunity. It's a fantastic circuit. I think you've been there yourself, Dave. Yes. There. And I think that whoever driver is driving in Mugello, very excited by the track. Uh, because you've got only fast corners and uh, even the chicane are on the third gear, at least minimum. So myself, obviously, uh, at the time of Michael, since 1995, we are always testing there. So I think that's the circle where I did myself most of the, the mileage. Um, but it's a fantastic and demanding, high demanding track huh, for the driver, for the car, for the tires. Uh, and I think everywhere, they, most drivers will be excited or or scared, I don't know, but uh, I'm curious I'm curious to see a, a race there because we have been always testing, but there have never been an F1 race in Mugello. Uh, so let's let's see 20 cars on that track, what, what it may make, uh, but you're right, it's an incredible track. Yeah, fantastic circuit. It, it really made me feel like a Grand Prix driver when I tested there, and I've had the opportunity to watch MotoGP, which is fantastic there. So uh, hopefully that's a, a strong race for you. Um, and you mentioned just, maybe maybe you did because I think that's that you mentioned the MotoGP. So MotoGP are used to go there uh, for the for their own Grand Prix. And MotoGP is lapping in Mugello in 150 and F1 in 120. Uh. So that's the difference. So it means that an F1 is catching up a MotoGP in three laps. And <laughs> if ever I've seen a MotoGP drive running there and driving, it's it's incredible. It's so they are so fast, but at the end the difference is 30 laps, 30 seconds per lap. Yeah, no, Formula One is the absolute pinnacle of automotive technology and it's a, an incredible display of what uh, humans can deliver on a racetrack. Maybe just on conclusion, you, you touched on it right at the very beginning. Uh, Formula One is all about the future. The past is interesting. It's great to celebrate past, but it's about creating new, new memories. So maybe you can just touch a little bit on what we can expect the, the rest of the year. You've got two fantastic drivers and maybe throwing forward uh, to maybe for our Spanish fans, you can touch a little bit on uh, <laughs> Carlos for, for next year. Well, as far as looking ahead uh, and looking forward to the future, I think that F1 has to remain somehow a platform for innovation. And that's important and from the technical innovations. Innovation is as well about sustainability. I think really our efforts today together with F1 and FIA to is even to make the sports more sustainable in the future, which is great and important. Uh, if you, you, as you said, if you look at this year, next year, we know that 2020 is a difficult season for us. No doubt it has been difficult since the very start. Uh, very little opportunities of development. Uh, 
most of the components frozen. As well, 2021, few opportunities, brand new engine will be there. We are working very hard at the dyno, really to develop it as much as we can. A few freedom on the IROS for next year. So, so maybe obviously our objective is to make sure that next year will be a better season compared to, to the current one. And then we've got 2022, which I think is a fantastic or incredible discontinuity, completely new cars, new, new regulations, new shapes, new aero, uh, starting from white paper, everyone starting from scratch. No team can work on it up to the 1st of January. So we will start working on the 1st of January on the aerodynamics of 2022. Uh, and so quite exciting, I think, uh, that I'm pretty sure will make the, our sport stronger. Uh, will make our sport more spectacular. And, uh, and obviously, Scuderia Ferrari will be part of it. And uh, yeah. our objective is to be the strongest as possible by then. And, and you mentioned our Spanish driver next year. I think, again, it's uh, another young driver, but somehow already experienced. He did a fantastic race, by the way, in Monza. Uh, I think he's young, but experienced. Charles is very young as well start to have his own experience. I think overall, Scuderia Ferrari today is a young team, as we've got young drivers, and we are creating our own experience. So that's why I said maybe it may take some time, need patience, but creating solid foundations on the base of young organization, young teams, young drivers, I think that's great. It's not just about the Formula One team, you have the Driver Academy as well. How much are you watching this or influencing its future? Uh, we are, obviously, uh, FDA, Ferrari Driver Academy, is part of Scuderia Ferrari. It's part of our programs. Uh, we are managing, managing them directly. We are very much involved. I think we are trying to put in place a great program. It's not only this season in F2, which I think we've got our three drivers on the top three at the moment in the, in the classifications, but it's uh, really looking at the future. And uh, we have established as well uh, important partnerships and collaborations for, for scouting in all the areas of the world, and whatever it is, Asia, Pacific, South of America, Europe. Uh, looking for really young, uh, young drivers, young talents, wherever they are coming from. Uh, we've got a, a partnership, a collaboration with FIA, with four girls back on track. So looking and seeking for young, talented uh, girls, uh, drivers. So, so I think we are putting a lot of effort in it. Obviously, if you look at Sharps, it has been a great, great, great investment. And I think that uh, if we can, we are trying to really to boost that organization and that uh, uh, the Ferrari Driver Academy, because we really believe that can be our future. That's a beautiful place to uh, thank you for your time and to wrap this up. And to wish Ferrari the very best for the next 70 years in Formula One. I know you're in the office, so you can't, but I'm going to have a little cheers on my Heineken 00 here. And on behalf of F1 Unscripted, Mattia, thank you yeah. very much for your time. Thank you. Cheers. Oh, bye.